Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash 1PVS2P. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash 1PVS2P to get a free audiobook download. Thanks to Audible for supporting our podcast, and thanks to you for supporting us. Reviewers are raving about Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. New mobile Fire Emblem games are coming out surprisingly soon. Plus, this week in video game history seven years ago, BioWare and EA release Mass Effect 2 on Xbox 360 and PC. All that and some new game releases, announcements, and more. You're listening to the 1P vs. 2P podcast. I'm Taylor Ray. With me, as always, is my brother and co-host, Ryan Ray. We're going to get started with First Attack. First Attack, our top stories for this week. Actually, just one story we're going to cover. Square Enix. They've announced that they're making the Avengers and more Marvel games. Uh, Marvel is moving back into console gaming. The comic book company announces a multi-year, multi-game partnership with the developer Square Enix, beginning with what's called the Avengers Project. Right, so these games are being developed by Crystal Dynamics, which is under the Square Enix umbrella, in collaboration with Eidos Montreal. And they're calling this Avengers Project game the working title. It's the first title in this newly announced partnership. The description from the trailer is pretty vague. They said, quote, The Avengers Project is being designed for gamers worldwide and will be packed with all the characters, environments, and iconic moments that have thrilled longtime fans of the franchise. Featuring a completely original story, it will introduce a universe gamers can play in for years to come. This move comes off of probably the popularity of the Avengers movies, Guardians of the Galaxy. A lot of the Marvel properties have been getting a lot of notoriety in pop culture circles, and this is probably why they're trying to get back into video games. Comic books and video games just totally make sense. For me, I would love for this to actually be like a Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, but even better than the first two. Maybe sprinkle a little bit of the RPG elements that X-Men Legends had a little bit more. Uh, I would love to see Avengers games like this. If I had to recall like an Avengers game that I've last played, it was probably Captain America and the Avengers on the SNES. That was pretty terrible. Uh, But that was my background to the Avengers uh, when it came to Marvel games. Like that was it. So it's interesting that they're coming back in a big way, considering that all these movies are extremely, extremely popular. So this just makes sense. But very interesting that Square Enix is working on it. I, I, w- I would be anxious to see what kind of game it is, whether it's an RPG, an action adventure. Uh, that would be what we'd expect. But man, I'm very curious about it. But I guess we're going to expect these in 2018 next year. So we'll definitely revisit it whenever they formally announce those. All right. Well, that was pretty much it for our top stories. Uh, we didn't find many other ones we wanted to discuss. So we're going to move right along to a lot of new game releases. I love new releases. A lot of releases this past week and then a lot of releases This week, so starting off with this coming week, Kingdom Hearts HD 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue for PS4. That is the most convoluted title I think I've ever read on this show. Uh, So what this is, it's a collection of three Kingdom Hearts related content. There's uh, Kingdom Hearts X back cover. It's a series of cutscenes that goes into the backstory of the original game. Kingdom Hearts 0.2 Birth by Sleep, a fragmentary... Oh my god, a fragmentary passage. Jeez. Uh, It's a new game that follows another Keyblade hero, Aqua. And then there's the third one, Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance, which is an HD remake of the 3DS game released just a few years ago. Uh, Considering that these original, uh, or I should say at least Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance, already was a ridiculously long title. Ryan, have you played that one at least? I have not. The only Kingdom Hearts games I've played were the original and Kingdom Hearts 2. And then after that, it the series fell off into a cliff that I... The, the titles of these games are way simpler than trying to explain the convoluted story and narrative <laughs> that this, this series has followed. Uh, something about Heartless, there's Disney characters, there are Keyblade Masters, they've been fighting this eternal holy Keyblade war. 
I have been just sticking to the numbered Kingdom Hearts games, uh, the ones with the really ridiculously long titles. I, it's like following the the Zelda time trilogy timeline thing. I, the chronology doesn't make any sense. And I'm really just there for the gameplay and for the Disney tie-ins. But so weird that they've announced so many of these spinoffs that came out on, on Vita. I think there was like a mobile title that was Japan only. But so weird. But I think what people are really looking for is the next numbered one, three. So we've seen that being teased with gameplay footage recently. No recent announcements about it, though. Moving on to Yakuza 0 on PS4. This was actually released this past week. Very hilarious cutscenes I've seen online on Twitter posted. You've been playing it so far, though. I've noticed you've been playing it on PSN, right, Ryan? Yeah, and I, I'm really enjoying my time with it. This is a prequel of the gangster slash brawler slash Japanese soap opera Yakuza series. Uh, this game focuses on the origin stories of series hero Kazuma Kirdu and the series oddball Goro Majima. You play as both characters. The stories kind of happen simultaneously. Uh, you switch between the two characters at different points in the story. And this game seems to be Sega testing the waters to see if the Yakuza games in the West can get a bigger audience than they have been so far. This series originally started on the PS2. I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but they've released a lot of these, uh, the series entries on the PS2, the PS3. Um, you know, more recently, they've released Yakuza 4, Yakuza 5. There was that zombie Yakuza game, Yakuza Dead Souls. Uh, this, this is really trying to go for testing the waters because they're redoing Yakuza 1 this year. Uh, I think that's called Yakuza Kiwami. And they're seeing if there really is an audience for this really, really Japanese culture heavy, heavy Japanese-influenced game. It, expect a review from our site on this on this game. It's it, I'm totally engrossed. I'm having a lot of fun. Those are my early impressions so far. We'll see where the story goes. All right, then we have another game that came out this past week, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard on Xbox One, PS4, also PSVR, and also PC, although there is no uh, official VR support when it comes to the PC release. It seems like the the, the PSVR is actually a timed exclusive. We're expecting it to only be for a year before it's released, let's say, on the Oculus Rift and also the HTC Vive. No formal announcement just yet. But here it is. This Resident Evil game is like a huge departure from the past couple Resident Evil games, like 4, 5, and 6, even Revelations. It's not really that action-adventure-style game. It is truly a horror game. And the early reviews for this is that PSVR is the absolute way to play this game for the absolute first person horror experience, right? <laughs> how how into the Resident Evil games have you been? I I've have been there mostly for the uh, big action game moments. I think Resident Evil 4 is one of the greatest games of all time. But how are you with like Resident Evil 1, 2, 3? Have you been following the series story and story beats? I've never really been a huge fan. I actually prefer the more action-heavy games. In fact, the, the Resident Evil I played the most was 5, which I know was pretty unpopular with fans because it went away from the survival aspect and the horror aspect and turned it more into... Uh, more of like a Gears of War style, if I could describe it. Uh, I really enjoyed the co-op in that game, but I absolutely recognize that Resident Evil 4 was the pinnacle of the series. It really is an incredible, incredible game. I, I can't remember where I heard this phrase, but someone described Resident Evil as a series, as a franchise, as like cautious optimism because they have like huge uh, swing and misses for me. Like the the... The Revelations games, I thought, were kind of boring, and then Resident Evil 6 was just incredibly terrible, and then you have this game, which is very, very different. You're wandering around this very dark, horrifying mansion in a first-person perspective. It's going back to its roots with, like, limited ammo, limited save points, uh, limited resources, and the, the prospect of VR playing something like this, a horror game, is really, really exciting to me. Although I don't own it yet, I feel like this is the game to play if you own PSVR so far. Based on the reviews that I've been reading yet. Uh, of course, I haven't played it yet. Yeah, definitely. That's what I've been hearing too. And knowing that this game is kind of a departure from uh, series mainstays like uh, Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine and that whole convoluted thing with the Umbrella Corporation, I hear there's some very interesting references in this game and also some some neat 
callbacks to uh, like door puzzles and some of the more like stereotypical Resident Evil elements that you might expect. But I'm looking forward to checking this game out later. Horror isn't exactly the kind of video game I tend to gravitate towards, but we're already hearing echoes as this game as uh, a could potential contender for game of the year this year which it seems really early to be even thinking about that uh, as it's only january but uh, i'm glad that there's a good resident evil game again and uh, it just feels like we've it's been there's been a long time since we've had a good resident evil game yeah as far as the characters go it's definitely a departure you play as this uh, new character ethan winters who gets a mysterious message from his missing wife she's in louisiana in this mansion owned by the baker family the story is really separated from the older plot lines with the umbrella company and the the bows but there are really like like you said ryan some really smart ties in there don't want to get into spoilers too much but very excited to check this game out from what i understand there's actually an upcoming uh, amazon lightning deal on this game so even if you don't own a psvr what reviewers are saying is that's the absolute ideal way to play this but it is still definitely a game you can still play without it. You can still play it on PS4, Xbox One, or PC just with controllers or mouse and keyboard. So uh, definitely, definitely very interested in it. Uh, moving on to Tales of Berseria uh, coming out this upcoming week on PS4 and PC. I've seen some gameplay footage of this game. It reminds me a lot of Star Ocean, the first and the second one, the second story. The Tales games have always had this very active combat system. Uh, you're you're playing as multiple characters, uh, or usually you're playing as one character and three AI buddies. This is just another installment of, of the JRPG uh, long-time series. Uh, Berseria, however, is the first game to have a leading female protagonist. Her name is Raven, and her default costume is... Uh, somewhat revealing, let's say, uh, shows a lot of cleavage if you're if you're into that. But uh, this is a, these are T-rated games. They have a lot of like skits and um, character moments and a lot a lot of lighthearted action. But uh, they tend to be very very bright RPGs, very different than uh, let's say Final Fantasy. But it's another one of those games for better or for worse. If you haven't checked into the Tales games, uh, Tales of Asperia was probably the last big game in that franchise that people really paid attention to. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, it's out there now for you. And then the last notable one we noticed that's coming out this coming week, Double Dragon 4 for PS4 and PC. Very interesting because if you look at the Double Dragon series as a whole, most recently... The last one I can remember is Double Dragon Neon, which was a very, very cool, modern, side-scrolling brawler. The art style was definitely hand-drawn, more cartoony, but definitely not 8-bit like the original ones were uh, that were released on the NES, but also on the arcade as well. But when it comes to Double Dragon 4, it's actually, in the, in the series, it is actually a continuation of the story from Double Dragon 2, The Revenge, featuring some new enemies and a new co-op mode in the sense that you have Billy and Jimmy as playable characters, but then you progress through a new tower mode that will unlock enemies for use in the story mode. Yeah, so this game is being made by uh, fighting game Japanese developer Arc System Works. They've been kind of known for the more... They're like the uh, anime game, anime fighting game company that uh, made the Persona, 3, uh, Persona 4 uh, Ultimax and Persona 4 Arena, and uh, Guilty Gear, Zerd, all these these styles of games. Uh, it makes sense that they would be the developer tapped for, for this franchise. And the release of this game is uh, in line with a, an important anniversary for Double Dragon, 30 years since the original game was released. I really enjoyed the first two Double Dragon games. Uh I, I think it's kind of fallen off the map a little bit. Gamers aren't as interested in playing these kinds of side-scrolling brawler games as much. Uh, some of their their tropes haven't aged as well, but Double Dragon definitely one of the, the sta- or at least two, definitely one of the standout games from that genre way back in the day. So I'm looking forward to seeing if this game is actually any good uh, or if it even, uh, you know, furthers the chance that we're going to see more more games with Billy and Jimmy in them. Yeah, same. You don't see a lot of these games getting released uh, recently, but I still love Double Dragon as a series. You you have to go back to Battletoads and Double Dragon, one of my all-time favorites. We spent so much time playing that on co-op. I would love to revisit something like that. I I think that is still a bankable gameplay style, but, but there hasn't been any really 
uh, huge notable ones that have been multiplayer uh, recently. Um, I, I could think of like Castle Crashers, definitely moving on, living on to that legacy. But yeah, it, it, it's definitely Double Dragon. I'm ready for a new one for sure. Uh, new video game announcements. Here we go. Here comes a new challenger. On my count, I have four new Fire Emblem games from a recent Nintendo Direct that was after all the Switch announcements. So here we go. First, we have Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia on 3DS coming out this year, May 19th, which is uh, the next in the series of like Fire Emblem Awakening, Fire Emblem Fates, uh, Birthright. It's the next one. Very similar. Uh, what else is there to say about it, Ryan? Uh, it sounds like the characters are actually going to have feet, which is that's something you care about. What? <laughs> That is something that Fire Emblem fans actually care about. Uh, you know, I think Fire Emblem kind of saved itself as a franchise with Awakening. Uh, I thought Fates tried to continue with that, but it's not as good of characters. Uh, but there were at least three games worth of content that you could explore there. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally interested in a new Fire Emblem game of this style. I'm actually interested in all of these Fire Emblem games that we're going to go down this list for. But uh, I think I think the franchise has done well on the 3DS and on the, the DS and the, uh, the GBA. Nintendo's first attempts at bringing Fire Emblem to the to the West were on the uh, Game Boy Advance with Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones, I believe, was their first attempt. And then that became popular, and then they remade the original Fire Emblem that was only on Super Famicom, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a franchise that was basically dead, and they revived by making the game, the strategy game more about relationships and uh, who your waifus would be, and, uh, you know, which, you know, creating character relationships so that they would support better support you in battle. And I think people have really glommed onto that. Yeah, I'm no Fire Emblem historian, but a quick Google search while we're recording tells me that uh, it's actually, Sacred Stones was actually the second one out here in the West, coming out in 2005 uh, on Game Boy Advance. And then the original one, which was just called Fire Emblem uh, here in the States, uh, which was known as the Blazing Sword in Japan, was actually released in 2003, but we've definitely come a long way. I, I do recall when those GameCube games and and I think there was a Fire Emblem that was released on on the Wii as well. It was definitely on the ropes. That that series just was not very popular here in the U.S., but there was certainly a very anxious fan base when Fire Emblem Awakening came out, and Nintendo was. I, I remember there were leaks and rumors that if it didn't sell over a certain threshold they wouldn't bother porting any more over here. It's very, very, very popular in Japan, nonetheless. But I'm very glad that uh, Awakening had, had a huge, huge resurgence. It was a very, very popular title. At one point, very difficult to find because they weren't anticipating all the demand for it. So very excited that these new four Fire Emblem games have been announced here because, yeah, I think Nintendo recognizes the the clamor for them. So... Uh, so there's that one. Then we also have Fire Emblem for the Nintendo Switch. Not an official title. It's a working title. Fire Emblem Switch coming out sometime in 2018. And then there's Fire Emblem Warriors, which that is actually the title for. One that's coming out on the Switch and the 3DS sometime in the fall of this year. What's that about? So this is a Dynasty Warrior style game, more in the mold of Omega Force has really been <laughs> farming out the Dynasty Warriors model of gameplay onto other IP. They did uh, Dragon Dragon Quest Heroes. They did uh, Hyrule Warriors. Uh, and these games have been really like taking off. I, I really enjoy this kind of like mindless gameplay. And it seems like Fire Emblem is totally made for that, right? It's a military strategy game. So that totally plays into all the tropes that Dynasty Warriors also plays in. I'm super excited for this game. It's interesting that they're co-developing both a Switch version and a 3DS version. We thought that with the release of the Switch, they would be kind of tapering down the 3DS games. But, uh, you know, there's still a lot of 3DSs out there. So I suspect that's really why uh, they're making a 3DS version of the game. There were there was a 3DS and Wii U version of Hyrule Warriors. So um, we'll see how those do uh, against each other. But I am super excited for this game as well. I bet there's going to be like a ton of playable characters, just like Hyrule Warriors, just like Dynasty Warriors series. Yeah, Fire Emblem seems ripe for that. There's just so many. I can't even name more than 10. I can't even remember them. But Fire Emblem Heroes, this is a new game on mobile. This is the last one that they announced. Coming very, very soon, February 2nd 
on both Android and iOS. This is a interesting mobile title because Nintendo is holding this like poll, like this contest to see who are the who are your favorite Fire Emblem characters. Uh, I'm not sure what the tie-in is yet to make sure that they're included. I'm sure they're included, but what this is is it's a collectible tactical style game on mobile, right? Right, and it's going to feature uh a uh, free-to-play business model that if you've been playing mobile games for the last few years, you might be familiar with. It's called Gacha, uh, which was basically, in Japan, there are these little uh, collectible capsule toys that you can put put money into a machine and you randomly get a, a chance at one of them. And a lot of mobile games have taken this free-to-play business model, blind boxes. Uh, you basically pay money and you, you buy a random character or a power-up or whatever. And this is Nintendo's first true attempt at this kind of business model. In the past, they've kind of stayed away because they thought they were ripping off kids and families, and Nintendo really hasn't been uh, after the market in that way. But this this game reflects really Nintendo's uh, third attempt on mobile to try to get people uh, people who play cell phone games into Nintendo properties. Uh, the first one was uh, Miitopia, or not Miitopia, what was that Mitomo. game? Mitomo. Mitomo. The first game was Mitomo. That was a little bit like Tomodachi Life. It didn't really take off. Super Mario Run, you know, featured everybody's favorite plumber, but really didn't set the world on fire. You know, a lot of runners were way more popular than that game turned out to be. And this is Nintendo's third third attempt at a, a mobile game. And Fire Emblem, like we just said, is a huge, huge franchise now. People are really interested in the characters. People really like the dialogue moments and you know some of the the, char- the aspects of the characters so we'll see if people spend a lot of money on the free to play transactions in this game and we'll see how much they cost too i'm super curious about this game and we'll also see how deep the strategy element to it is too i imagine for a cell phone game it probably isn't that much but if we're not going to get a new advanced wars and we're going to continue to get fire emblem games hopefully we're going to continue to get good fire emblem games so the series doesn't die like it almost once did. Yeah, well said. And speaking of a series that is nearly dead, at least here in the US, because this game was actually released in 2015 in the arcades in Japan, but Tekken 7 finally is going to come out on Xbox One, PS4, and PC on June 2nd this year. Right, so this installment of Tekken is supposed to be the final conclusion, the climax between Heihachi, you know, the old guy with the weird hair, and his son Jin, who's become some sort of demon over the <laughs> the series, uh, and they're presumably going to be fighting in or around a volcano. This <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this this fighting game series is based on a lot of combo systems, uh, has a diverse cast, and is also just known for being way over the top with some of the stories. Uh, I think Tekken Three was on the place. PlayStation 1 was the original game that kind of spelled that out for people. And I think the franchise hasn't been as popular since. Uh, It's been popular in Japanese arcades for sure. And uh, there have been some uh, console versions of the game, mostly with Tekken Tag Tournament and Tekken Tag Tournament 2. And some people really like the gameplay of that, but I don't think they've really followed the kind of uh, insane story story beats that <laughs> this franchise has followed. So uh, looking forward to that game and looking forward to, you know, a, a new fighting game that could maybe take on Street Fighter. Uh, Street Fighter V just wasn't doing it for a lot of people last year. So hopefully Tekken 7 can retake the, the throne. Yeah, and don't forget about uh, Tekken 5 and 6, which were quite disappointing over here. Uh, also Tekken 4, we forgot to mention that as well. I mean, there were, there were several that I think were very forgettable in the middle there. But yeah, certainly Tekken 3 and Tekken Tag Tournament were the, the last ones that I really enjoyed Tekken 7. Very, very much looking forward to that game. Uh, And then we're going to run through these last two. We have Super Mario Sports Superstars on March 24th. That's coming out with Amiibo card support. Right. So this is a sports game that features Mario characters playing five different sports in this package. Soccer, baseball, tennis, golf, and horse racing. Uh, This game is being co-developed by Bandai Namco and Camelot. Uh, Camelot, of course, originally responsible for the very popular Mario Tennis and Mario Golf games. There have been other Mario sports games with these other sports involved. Uh, Horse racing was in the uh, Mario and Sonic Olympic Games, so they're just looking to mash up all these sports mini games into one package for on the 3DS. So that's coming out soon. I didn't know that this game was being developed, but okay, sure, why not? Interesting uh, that they didn't announce this for the Switch. It's coming out only on 3DS yet so far, so no port. 
Uh, here we go. Finally, the last notable announcement. We have Dirt 4 revealed, confirmed for June of this year. Get this. It's been six years. Can you believe that? Since Dirt 3, Codemasters, the developer, they're announcing a new sequel. It's going to come to the PC, Xbox One, and PS4. And the theme for this one is, quote, be fearless. Right, and it sounds like the developer from the trailer, at least, wants to put more of an emphasis on rewarding risky behavior than previous titles have featured. Uh, I'm all on board for that because I think uh, car racing games can get kind of boring when it's the simulation style. You know, let's just turn right in a circle for 24 hours or whatever <laughs> the Gran Turismo games tend to be. Um, the D- Dirt franchise has really been more about rallycross and uh, the like jumping through dirt and snow and all these kinds of really interesting environments and drifting. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, the, the last few games in this mode, uh, dirt, dirt three and, uh, grid, uh, have been, have came out recently on PC for free. And I think that was them testing the waters to see if, if there was going to be an audience for this style of game again. But, uh, apparently that did well enough to, to make a new dirt four. So, uh, super curious what that's going to turn out to be. Hopefully this will be the racing game for people who aren't serious racers. History. No one wants to admit it, but humanity is under attack. One very specific man might be all that stands between humanity and the greatest threat of our brief existence. Shepard! This week in video game history, Mass Effect 2 was released on January 26th, 2010 on PC and Xbox 360. It was later released just a year later on PlayStation 3, so making it now seven years old. Wow. I mean, revisiting the Mass Effect trilogy is like, for me at least, revisiting the Star Wars original trilogy. This is an incredible, incredible series by Bioware, published by EA. No matter what Mass Effect Andromeda coming out soon ends up being, It really won't take away from the really hugely impressive games that preceded it. For me, Mass Effect 2 is definitely the Empire Strikes Back of this series. It's definitely the highlight uh, so far. Mass Effect 1 set the bar very, very high, similar to the KOTOR style of games, but with cover shooter elements. Um, But with Mass Effect 3... It really missed its mark. If you haven't played Mass Effect 3, the original ending was extremely, extremely disappointing. Did not tie up many loose ends. But Mass Effect 2 is, I think, the most memorable of the series, given its characters, uh, how much of the story that they cover with uh, Commander Shepard's arc, whether you play as male or female Shep. What what do you remember most about Mass Effect 2, Ryan? I mean, I think for me, the Mass Effect... Uh, well said. Uh, I think the Mass Effect franchise is totally the Star Wars of video games. Um, I think Mass Effect 1 was a lot of table setting, a lot of setting up the universe, getting you interested in uh, Shepard's story. And then 2 is totally the dark middle chapter, uh, totally the best game in, in this series by far. Just a, a lot of, you know, f- from the premise, it starts off as, you know, Sh- Shepard basically dies and then gets reconstructed more or less is in the service of of this guy, the elusive man, uh, great sidekick slash villain yeah. maybe, and at least in, at least by two, you're not sure which side he's he's on, and then he kind of contracts you to stop this this invisible force to try to get to the bottom of, and then you find out that it's a suicide mission, so. Uh, you go around the galaxy, completing side quests, getting to know your crew a little bit better, um, trying to recruit the best characters to go on with you uh, on this suicide mission. And uh, basically, how much progress you make in this game, uh, how much you dive into the side stories, what choices you decide to make, uh, determines who, who lives or dies uh, in this in the final suicide mission in the game. And they're very they're very heavy handed with telling you like, okay, if you don't go through all the way, some people may not survive the mission. I think it just they they smoothed out the gameplay issues from the, the, the original game. It, it, this game was just a ton of fun. I love the characters, particularly for me, what stand out, uh, character that stands out is Morden Solis, the Solarian scientist uh, who also sings... You just, performed Gilbert and Sullivan? 
I am the very model of a scientist Salarian. I've studied species Turian, Asari, and Batarian. I'm quite good at genetics as a subset uh, a great, of biology. A great, great character. A lot of other great characters too. Miranda Lawson. Uh, they really fleshed out Garrus's backstory. They they gave you a biotic in Jack. Uh, you know the silent monk like assassin Thane. You know f- Legion. Oh yeah! Don't can't forget about Legion. He's my he's my favorite of the series. Right, and then they also introduced you to the ship's AI Edie, who play has a bigger role to play in three. Uh, the Joker gets a, a backstory. Your your trusty Normandy pilot. What a fantastic game with so much lore, so much detail. I I even loved the like mining aspect of the like gathering resources so that you could pay for your uh, research upgrades and ship upgrades. Uh, there isn't an aspect of this game that I I frankly don't like. Even the DLC that they included. The DLC included uh, two really interesting characters. One who was this kind of like Yakuza mob boss style character. Very, very cool. And the other, which was this kind of like thief character, Kasumi, I believe was her name. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just the character classes in that game. Super fun. I played as uh, la- the shotgun charge class. It was uh, half combat, half biotic. Uh, Taylor, you probably focused more on the biotic and tech powers, right? Well, I actually focus on, yeah, the soldier and... Um the yeah the tech tree so my my strategy was as shepherd i could easily attack the geth you know disable them but also i was using assault rifles and shotguns as well with the soldier classes so dealing high damage uh, i didn't really bother with the biotics so i always at least had characters that had the biotic ability so i could deal with uh, some of the other races uh, when the enemies are charging at you but I mean, you you said it. I think the the real personal relationships and the connections you form with Shepard's crewmates and these side missions, they call them loyalty missions, are really incredible, incredible side quests and some of the most memorable in any RPG of all time in the sense that they don't feel like throwaways. You get to know these characters and their motivations and their hesitations. Like you, you find out with Tali, you know, as she opens up about all her insecurities, you could form like a romantic relationship with her and she struggles with protecting her race and what they stand for and uh, how how she can work with another crewmate in Legion who's a geth, who's their sworn enemy. It's very, very fascinating. Like it's hard to go into all the story beats of Mass Effect 2, but just, I was delighted throughout it. Yeah, and the, and the, the the villain in this game is the collectors. They're, like, collecting humans for this unknown purpose, and you're trying to figure out why people are disappearing across the galaxy. The one thing that I will say about Mass Effect 2 that's bad is the final boss fight. Basically, you fight this giant Terminator 2-style uh, enemy. It's just, it's, it's, uh, that that part is legitimately bad, but everything yeah. e- besides that, everything leading up to that moment in Mass Effect Two is fantastic and definitely a, a standout game in this franchise. Just happy birthday, seven years old! What an incredible game! Arguably one of the games of last generation, Mass Effect Two. Oh, so good! Makes me want to play it again. Yeah, and it makes you excited for some Mass Effect Andromeda action. Definitely. <laughs> All right, let's wrap the show up with the bonus stage. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Playable via a Super Nintendo emulator, NBA Jam 2K17 is a roster hack designed to reflect this year's lineups, though the teams and logos are still the same, so the Thunder are still the Seattle Supersonics, etc. There's also a cast of secret players like Donald Trump, Kanye West, and the Gorilla Harambe. Check out the YouTube channel Hogs with a Blog for the trailer. If they were to make a new NBA Jam game, I would totally expect this kind of roster update with uh, memorable political and uh, meme humor in, in the basketball franchise, for sure. A German commercial for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, that Switch title, shows off various locations you can take your Switch to play on the go, including, and we're not kidding, the toilet. This isn't the first time, actually, that Nintendo advertised playing their games while on a toilet, like there was this GameCube Waver controller magazine ad. This one, you gotta title it. I just thought of this. It's the Joy Constipation ad. Ugh. <laughs> All right, moving on. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is not an easy game, but speedrunner Parisian player managed to defeat every one of its bosses and complete the entire game in one sitting while blindfolded. It just took him 
over nine hours. Yeah, definitely interesting technique that he used. He basically built kind of a sonar uh, using the sound effect of the sword clinking against metal objects in that game. Really, really cool. I, I recommend you check out even part of the speed run. A very, very impressive feat. Congratulations to him. And he did it very quickly. Nine hours blindfolded is impressive. I don't even think I can beat that game in <laughs> under nine hours with my eyes open. He expected it to take 12 hours, so imagine that. All right, that's it for this week's episode. Remember to listen and subscribe to our show, the 1P versus 2P podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn, or bookmark our website, 1PVS2P.com. There you can read our gaming blog, too. Our sources for this week's stories have been posted at the link in the show notes. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or follow us on Twitter. We're very active there, at 1PVS2P underscore podcast. Thank you to Phonetic Hero, as always, for letting us play his music for our show. Coffee Stomp and Super Manly Brothers X, both of those songs, are part of the compilation project. Chip Tunes equals win. I'm Taylor Ray. That's my co-host, Ryan Ray. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next week. And Nintendo Switch on a toilet. <laughs> Play it while you poop. <laughs> How about two girls, one Switch? <laughs> oh my god, that's bad. But sure, why not? <laughs> How about do, two Joy-Cons, one Switch? <laughs> Joy-Constipation. There you go. That, that's, that's the pun I'm looking for. <laughs>